Okay, so welcome everyone um, to the, the first in the new uh, semester, new year of the Trinity Department of Geography seminar series. We are delighted to have Drew Pallant, who is this year uh, the 2022 Fulbright US Scholar to Ireland and uh, who is being hosted here um, at Trinity College uh, Geography Department. And Drew is coming from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the USA, where he's a, a part of the Office of Research and Development. And I want to get the, the, the title of your, your full title of your, of your talk today, Drew. Um, he's gonna to talk to us about GIS and Geography of Ecosystems, Goods and Services, the PFAS and the Agriculture at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And I think Drew is gonna talk um, about a little bit about his research and also just his experience working in, in, the, in the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, obviously, for those of us who are interested in environmental governance, it's a kind of a, has been a, a leading light in the development of environmental governance and institutionalization of it, but is also fraught with uh, political problems and so on, uh, with the changing climate that, that uh, we have in a political climate. Okay, so I'll hand it over to Drew. I see you've, you've shared your, your um, screen already. But, uh, welcome, Drew. And so in, a, in about you know, 40 minutes, if you can try and wind up, and then we'll, we'll open up to, to questions. Um, and I'll kind of field those for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Rory. Um, I'm, and I'm just excited to be here. Um, I wish we were in person because my jokes would convey better. Uh, they're likely to fall pretty flat. And that's, that's that. Um, let's keep it informal. Please uh, ask questions as we go along, if you like. This will probably be more like 30 minutes or less, leaving plenty of time for Q&A. And um, if you have questions in the chat, if I don't see them, perhaps Rory or Iris can uh, nudge me. So the title, GIS and Geography of Ecosystem Goods and Services, the GIS and Geography part, the geography part was to hook you folks in. The GIS part is that all of the things I talk about today are supported by GIS technology. PFAS is a class of emerging contaminants. Um, per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Ecosystem goods and services are nature's benefits that are difficult to quantify, but essential in decision-making in a systems context. If we can't represent nature's benefits well, they tend to be ignored or downplayed in environmental and economic decision-making. And then the agriculture part is specifically about animal agriculture. In the United States, we have a lot of animal uh, factory farms or concentrated animal feeding operations, and they present certain environmental issues that we'll touch on as we go. Uh, and I'll have some reflections or observations on the US Environmental Protection Agency. I'm trying to cover a lot of ground, and I hope it's, don't worry if it seems unfocused, it's a little bit all over the place. Um, my hope is to convey a little bit about my uh, background and skills so that I can be most useful and effective here in my time at Trinity College. Acknowledgements, the Fulbright Commission of Ireland and the Fulbright Commission in the United States. I'm honored to be a Fulbright Scholar. The Ge uh, Geological Survey Ireland is formally my sponsor, thank you. And my host institution, Trinity College Dublin, I'm thrilled to be here, literally. And special thanks to Dr. John Connolly and Iris Muller for getting me here and everyone in the department who's been so friendly. Um, disclaimer, the views here are expressed are my own and not of any of the organizations that support me. Um, how did I get here? Well, the, uh, and, and part of this is to uh, promote the Fulbright organization as a means to travel to the US to pursue uh, studies, research, and so forth. And how I got here was I looked over the catalog and Ireland was looking specifically for someone in geosciences. And I'm a geologist by training. So I wanted to do some remote sensing and that's my core specialty. And I Googled remote sensing Ireland. Uh, John Connolly appeared, <laughs> I wrote to him and we started uh, conversing and here I am now. And thanks to Iris, she was able to convince the uh, school that this was gonna be a good experiment. These are the themes and topics today, a little bit about Fulbright, a little bit about the US, 
a little bit about remote sensing, and then uh, some use cases. Uh, the Enviro Atlas that uh, is our uh, a national scale GIS, and then a little bit about mapping PFOS, another national scale GIS, and another uh, uh, national scale GIS of mapping animal agriculture. I'm a big fan of GIS technology and particularly how easy it is to make story maps and specialized web apps and dashboards. And if I forget to say it later, one of the key strengths of GIS is the ability to integrate diverse information. And it's a, a great way to bring physical and human geography together and all the tools that I will show examples of today are intended not for GIS experts, but for subject matter experts and general folks, because we're all now in the era of Google Maps, point and click, pan and zoom, turn layers on and off. All of these apps are designed with that in mind. And this is a kind of a revolution in mapping sciences and GIS in that we're putting the hand, this information at the fingertips of the subject matter experts where it needs to be. And also we can uh, form teams. We can all work on the same maps, the same story maps and uh, have a, a much, we'll, we'll all be on the same page, I hope. How did I prepare to come to Ireland? Well, it's a cultural experience. I wanted to come and kind of blank slate so mostly what I did was looked at some satellite images of Fair Ireland and watched Dairy Girls. Um, what a beautiful country. I think I have an affinity for Ireland. Um, I'm a pluviophile from the Pacific Northwest of Washington State in the, in the United States, though I live in North Carolina now. Um, turns out I have some Viking ancestry. I am a sea kayaker and hiker and geologist and, and all those things. Uh, brought me here, as well as traditional Irish music, which I've been playing for some time now. And upon uh, arrival, I found that everyone's friendly, fun, it's a dynamic place, and I'm just having uh, a lovely time. So thank you, Ireland. Just for fun, uh, I live in North Carolina, the red state on the uh, east coast of the US, and the blue polygon next to it is Ireland. And this is from uh, a map, darn it, I, I didn't credit it here, but it's uh, uh, a map that allows you to drag countries around so you can see their true size at a particular latitude. Because as you know, with Mercator projections or any map projection, when you take a three-dimensional sphere and put it in two dimensions, you sacrifice something along the way. Mercator is really good at preserving angles. And you wanna do that when you're sailing across the ocean, but it makes Greenland look as big as Africa. In fact, Africa is 14 times the size of Greenland. So um, it turns out that my state of North Carolina is a little bit bigger than Ireland. And uh, I don't know, I just thought it was an interesting spatial perspective. And here's another interesting map of Ireland. Um, these are rocks from each of the counties of Ireland. So the uh, Fulbright US Scholar Awards, um, I'll just mention a few things about Fulbright and please come talk to me later if you're interested. The Fulbright office is just around the corner on Marion Square and there are many programs. It can be a little bit confusing when you dive into the web and try to find the one you're looking for, but. I came on the exchange as a US scholar from the US to another country. And there are uh, Fulbright relationships that bring people from Ireland and other countries to the US. I'm here for 10 months. That's one of the longer ones. Some probably the shortest ones are just on the order of two or three months. Usually you just go to one country, but you can go to several countries. Um, but these are the uh, high points of the Fulbright uh, mission. Uh, cultural exchange program to create connections between citizens of uh, the world's countries to create a better world, ultimately. And it's a, a laudable goal and has, uh, there were some 400 something thousand people have participated in the Fulbright program so far. 
many heads of states and uh, 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 MacArthur Awards and other things like that. So I'll leave it at that. This is a little bit uh, from the uh, Fulbright Ireland office around the corner. And uh, you, don't, you don't have to be in academia, though I think everybody on the call is. I'm in a research lab at a US government um, agency. I'm the first person from the EPA to get a Fulbright. Uh, it, and it, it, you don't have to be scientists. There are people here doing literature. There's a librarian working at the Museum of Art, uh, a playwright, um, someone interested in music. So it's wide open. And I think one of the key things is to have a solid proposal and uh, make a contact at the other end so you've got someone to host you. And that, that's a pretty crucial one. And one more factor is that uh, certain countries or institutions are looking for someone in particular disciplines. So try to match your discipline with somewhere that has that discipline. Uh, mine boiled down to Ireland, Turkey, and Canada. And I, I chose Ireland. Uh, the year before I applied to go to Bhutan, but they were only looking for one person across all disciplines. So if you look at it that way, you can see if you can find, if you can match up your discipline with what the host is looking for at, in the US, then uh, your, your chances go up. Um, this is what the awards provide. It's a, a really great program. They don't provide housing, I will say, in, at least in my case. So I've discovered that you have a housing crisis here. Uh, we'll talk about that offline if you're interested. Um, but this is, and these are my goals, uh, build connections with people and institutions in Ireland, collaborate with staff and faculty at Trinity, most of all be useful and try to be an effective agent while I'm here. I'll be doing remote sen uh, research in remote sensing of peatlands with John Connolly and research in TBD, perhaps with Iris and the Coastal Geomorphology Group or others. And please let's talk and I, I look forward to learning about your research and interests as we go forward. And then um, I'm also interested in Irish traditional music and I play the baron and there's a whole uh, genre of jokes about that because the baron is very low on the food chain in Irish traditional music. So I'll crack a few of those offline. US EPA, our mission is to protect human health and the environment. Real simple, real straightforward. And I'm uh, really grateful to have stumbled into the EPA through a postdoc and have stayed for 22 years. I'm in the Office of Research and Development. So our, our job is to support our various regions and programs at the EPA with research that supports the agency mission. We're right now, we're at about 14,500 people. We've been in existence since the 1970s. Our formation, uh, we EPA formed from a number of maybe half a dozen or more uh, US government agencies were combined into the EPA in the 1970s. It was catalyzed by uh, circumstances such as Love Canal where the entire town was built on industrial waste, uh, very toxic waste, and it's a, a cancer hotspot. And uh, circumstances like uh, uh, a river catching on fire in uh, Ohio. These things brought a lot of attention to environmental situation and the EPA was what resulted. Our budget, Last year, this year was around $9.4 billion. And um, we are, uh, the, the staff at EPA, engineer scientists, attorneys, um, communication specialists, environmental justice outreach specialists, all across the spectrum, information technology, financial public affairs. So you can read that there. And, um, we are uh, often criticized. We're criticized by industry for being too strict in our regulations. And we're criticized by environmental community for being too lax in our regulations. So 
it's a very dynamic environment. Uh, I think our, my particular organization, R&D, we're a little bit re removed from the front lines of that. And so it's always educational to me to talk to my colleagues who are dealing with uh, constituents right there in their states who have concerns. And um, uh, another big part of our work is, you know, ivory tower research, publish, perish, all that. But it's very important that we make our scientific information and results accessible. So everything EPA does ends up uh, accessible online and that we communicate in, in ways that lay people can understand. And that, that's another thing I like about GIS is that the human visual processing system is so powerful and maps are very good at integrating uh, visual information. So um, that's one of the strengths. These are our core programs, but basically if it has anything to do with the environment or where people in the environment intersect, we are involved. And this is just a, a, a partial list of what we have. Uh, the EPA websites are a tremendous resource. Although we're uh, mostly dealing with the US, we do have international partnerships. But it, if you are interested in environmental topics, you may find uh, useful information at EPA websites. And I'm happy to help point you there. Uh, as well as uh, see how we are dealing with certain issues or some of the uh, many mapping applications we have to help ordinary citizens uh, do things like uh, understand their watershed and what industries are there and what water quality issues are in their watershed and who are the um, uh, non-governmental organizations they can affiliate with to help work on their watershed. So I'm gonna segue into my first topic of environmental goods and services, and that's with this Enviro Atlas. Uh, so this Enviro Atlas provides geospatial data, easy to use tools and other resources related to ecosystem services for chemical and non-chemical stressors in human health. So ecosystem goods and services are nature's benefits that are related to the environment. And there's the link right down there. This is just a screen capture of what, uh, you know, the, the landing page for the, um, the Enviro Atlas and the middle center panel on the top, the Enviro Atlas interactive map. I'll show you a screen capture of that. It is a really fascinating place to go. And also the EcoHealth Relationship Browser is a way to look for literature on various topics. It's a nice interactive uh, gizmo, but also very useful in seeing some connections in a graphical way rather than a strictly text or um, tabular way. We have a lot of educational materials and lesson plans. So if you're preparing something for K through 12, that's kindergarten through 12th grade, uh, maybe there's something there for you. And we have GitHub and other uh, geospatial um, assets and all of our layers are downloadable. Most of them, I think all of them are available as web services. Okay, so quickly I'm gonna shift to uh, remote sensing. What is remote sensing for our purposes today? It's using electromagnetic energy to extract information about the earth's surface or the atmosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, cryosphere, uh, but, but typically using aerial imagery, drones, aircraft, satellite. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum is responsible for all the technological uses you see in the little circles on the bottom of this graph. The wavy line represents the wavelength of light. Electromagnetic energy is simply light. It's not sound energy, gravitational energy, or thermal energy. Um, I forget what else there is, the weak and strong nuclear forces, but electromagnetic energy is just so embedded in our life. Um, we humans are most sensitive to visible light, uh, red, green, and blue light. And that coincidentally or non-coincidentally is 
uh, where we have an atmospheric window and we get, it's also the, the peak emission from the sun is in the visible wavelengths and the atmosphere is mostly transparent to visible light, except it seems today in Dublin. Um, so uh, a lot of satellite sensors operate in the visible part of the spectrum. And then of course, there's we're familiar with the near infrared part of the spectrum, which is used a lot in looking at vegetation and water. But there's uh, we can operate in any part of the spectrum. And the physical materials on the Earth's surface have characteristic interactions depending on the wavelength. If you want to do remote sensing, you need to know a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum. You have to know something about the physical phenomena you're working with. You need to have uh, uh, you need a reality check because it's really easy to put an image into some software, press go, something comes out, you write it up in a paper and send it off. Hopefully, you won't. But ground truth is really important, and you need and you need to understand the complexity of the physical environment out there to get robust results from your um, remote sensing efforts. And I'll say QA, quality assurance. We really emphasize that at EPA. That's a whole topic for another uh, seminar, but um, I'm sure we all think about it. I just want to mention that for the students who might be tuned in. So. Uh, let's talk about microwave for a moment. There's microwave radiation or radio waves. These are longer wavelengths down around from uh, visible light is on the order of micrometers, nanometers in wavelength. The microwave part of the spectrum, which microwaves use, radio, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, it's all happening there. Those are in the range of millimeters to several meters in wavelength. And they see through the atmosphere, day or night, uh, clouds, rain, right through it. And there's a revolution in uh, sensing systems now. Uh, so uh, in, in synthetic aperture radar, this is uh, a technology that happens in the microwave part of the spectrum. You have a satellite. It sends out a pulse of electromagnetic energy and then receives the reflected energy from the surface. You could look at the signals that are returned and that helps you understand what's going on there. Part of what's going on in, uh, in satellite imaging now is it used to be satellites costed, cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So there were very few of them. Now you can launch a satellite a CubeSat or a microsat, as they're called, they're literally the size of a shoebox. And it's all because uh, camera technology and communication technology and launch technology has gone down and um, electrical and engineering concepts have uh, advanced. So you could probably launch Trinity Sat for 100, under 100,000 euros, I would guess. Um, so we have constellations of high resolution sensors looking at the earth. And there's some new ones called, one's called ISI. And I think their goal is to image the entire earth every day at uh, a meter scale or multiple meters, which is revolutionary. Um, growing up, it was a big deal. If I, when I was in graduate school, we could get Landsat data at 30 meters per pixel, but only if we had $3,000 and this was, 20 something years ago when $3,000 was a lot of money. Now that data is free and uh, uh, now and uh, European Space Agency has Sentinel. Uh, it's just a tremendous time to be using uh, remote sensing assets. Okay, enough about that. Anyway, John and I want to look at peatlands using synthetic aperture radar technology, which is rather novel. Uh, it'll be good in Ireland because it can see through clouds and it's also the SAR is sensitive to texture, water content, um, the physical uh, roughness of the object. So there's a lot of things you can do with it. It's also, you're able to work with the polarization of the light, which is something you really can't do in very many other parts of the spectrum. You can tell I'm pretty excited about remote sensing. Anyway, just to hammer the point home, this is an image, uh, from the US on the left side, it's looking in the visible wavelengths of red, green, and blue. 
So we see agricultural fields and kind of a greenish looking river winding through. And on the right side, we're looking at a false color composite that uses infrared light. And you can see that bright red stuff is healthy vegetation. The kind of whitish stuff is probably uh, bare fields, so soil. And the uh, bluish cyan stuff is water with sediment in it. And then the dark blue stuff is um, probably just more clear water. But you can see that by using different wavelengths, you highlight different features in the scene. And that is the whole key to remote sensing, exploiting different wavelengths to uh, extract information about features and phenomena of interest. Okay, so EnviroAtlas, this is the uh, interface of the interactive map on the left. You can, there's a whole list of uh, data sets. There's widgets across the top and each widget does something. Um, it, 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 there's a little bit of learning curve, but I think as you go forth in your exploration of geospatial technology, you'll see that there is a convergence of the widgets and uh, this one's a little bit complicated, but uh, over time, you know, pan, zoom, turn things on and off and different tools will pop up. So uh, one of the projects I was involved with was creating high resolution land cover maps for the EnviroAtlas. And the purple dots here represent the cities or communities across the US that we did this for. By high resolution, I mean one meter pixel land cover. So we represent the land in terms of herbaceous vegetation, trees, water, impervious surfaces, wetlands, um, and that's about it. Very simple, but the status quo for the US is 30 meter resolution pixels. So we're at 900 times that resolution. So, and using those high resolution base maps, we create layers of ecosystem services. And I think there's somewhere between 85 and 100 of those layers are derived use that incorporate this high resolution land cover. These 30 cities, uh, cover about 60 million of the U.S. is 340 million people. So it's a pretty significant um, number of people. And the, uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, Enviro Atlas is also really good with education and outreach. So for each of our data layers, we have some 500 data layers. For the community's high resolution section, we have about 100 data layers. We have a two or three page fact sheet like this that explains how these data were formed. So we did image processing, image classification using uh, four band imagery, very simple, and created these land cover maps. So that's what this is. Um, this legend here and here shows the classes we use. This is a, uh, this pie chart just shows you that for that community, that's the breakdown of the various land cover classes. And then those, uh, and then on the right, we see a zoomed in look. These red, red, thing, red stuff's impervious surfaces. So that's roads, buildings, wetlands, and cyan. Light green is grass and herbaceous vegetation, and dark green is trees. And so you can see that we're picking up actual individual tree crowns, individual buildings, and so forth. This is becoming more common now. Uh, when we started this 15 years ago, it was uh, very rare to find data of this resolution. But again, it's a, a tremendous time to be in remote sensing geospatial science. This is another derived product, total carbon uh, stored by tree cover. So the darker the color, the greater the uh, uh, total carbon sequestered by tree cover in metric tons. And the uh, units of measurement here are these polygons are census block groups. So uh, what you're looking at is the area I live in, there's approximately two counties represented. And then within those counties, our US census breaks it down into further things. So I guess it's equivalent to Dublin 8, Dublin 6, et cetera. Um, and so that's just one of the reporting units we use. This is another interesting map. This is landscape uh, fragmentation and conductivity. So um, don't worry too much about all the details here, but green means uh, that's sort of more natural habitat and green space and red is red and uh, uh, gray is 
more developed or soil. So one example is if you want to maintain wildlife corridors or enhance existing wildlife corridors, look for the green areas and see where you have islands, core areas, and uh, potentially bridges. So it allows urban planners, regional planners to see where we can put in bikeways, where can we keep green space or protect green space so the foxes and the salamanders can get around in this shared human environment. Here's another ecosystem service, estimated tree cover within a 50 meter stream and lake buffer. So uh, green means, uh, I, I hope you can see, this is a map of Chapel Hill where I live. These white things are streets. So I uh, uh, apologize, there's no scale, but this thing's about two kilometers across. And these are stream corridors where you have green lines. It means you have a pretty healthy stream or riparian buffer. Uh, vegetated buffers are important because they maintain the natural processes we need to filter groundwater as it runs off the landscape into streams and into groundwater. And where it's red, you can see at a glance, okay, maybe we need to pay more attention to this and beef up the, uh, improve the uh, vegetative cover around those green, uh, around those streams. Uh, one last example, there's a land cover map on the left. On the right is a urban heat island map for Portland, Oregon. Um, the blue colors, the cooler colors are a lower uh, urban heat island effect and the red colors are higher urban heat island effect. I'm not sure how much you think about that here, but cities typically are urban heat islands. They trap heat, they, uh, and it's, it's a real problem in the United States and in Europe increasingly because it gets so dang hot. And partly that's due to climate change, partly it's natural variation, partly it's uh, lack of vegetation in urban centers. There's also an environmental justice or um, socioeconomic dimension of this where in uh, uh, impoverished neighborhoods typically have less tree cover and uh, wealthier neighborhoods have more tree cover and more green space and uh, thermal imaging and modeling can help you see where you are more likely to have heat stress and uh, authorities and developers can uh, address it better that way. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second before we go into our next topic. We are uh, on to PFAS and after that, we'll have a little bit about animal agriculture and then we'll be done. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Okay. I'm 30 I'm, minutes. So yeah, 10 more minutes, maybe if, if uh, that'd be okay. Max, if you can. Cheers, Drew. So PFAS, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, these are known as forever chemicals. They're forever because they don't break down fast in nature. Uh, that molecule on the bottom shows why fluorine and carbon, uh, they really bond tightly. These were invented in the 1940s, came into use in the 50s, and now 99% of humans have it in our bloodstream. Uh, we find it in uh, Teflon, stain resistant stuff, food packaging, grease resistant, um, and firefighting foam. So almost all airports have an issue with this, Department of Defense facilities. And it's an emerging topic. Um, the European Union is very concerned, the US EPA is concerned. Um, it usually comes into us through drinking water, but there are some other uh, exposure routes as well. So we did a, a, a national scale GIS called GeoPFOS for the geography of PFOS chemicals. This is an example of the kind of web app and dashboard we like to use where each of these panels is a different topic. You go into each panel and it allows the user to learn about what data sets are used and in other panels to pursue particular uh, topics of interest. Uh, these are some of the questions we can uh, ask. And uh, we designed this for EPA internal use just to help EPA staff get a handle on the PFAS situation in the US. Where are the hot spots? What industries are where and where might they be contributing to public and ecosystem health issues? This is a very important one. Uh, up on the left, this is an airstrip. It's a US Air Force base in New Mexico. And right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this brown area down here is a 
concentrated animal feeding operation. It's a dairy. And use of, atrip, of aqueous firefighting foam here to uh, this uh, PFAS chemicals are uh, widely used in uh, fire extinguishing foam. And they get into the groundwater and they went right in the groundwater down to the wells here, um, contaminated the wells and then contaminated the cows and that contaminated the milk. So they had to uh, dump thousands or tens of thousands of liters of milk a day. And finally they had to uh, put down the entire herd of 3000 or so cattle. So this is an example of a dashboard where you have an image on the left, a topographic uh, digital elevation model up on the upper right and kind of a hydrology layer on the lower right. But it's a very interesting hydrological situation. If we had more time, I'd show you that you can see that the orientation, northwest, southeast orientation of the hydrology and topography here is exactly what we have here. Here's the source, here's the sink, and there are more of these dairies down here. So um, this is the kind of way you can use GIS to help you at a glance, in fact, see where you might want to investigate further potential risks. Finally, uh, AFO map, AFO stands for animal feeding operation. Again, we built another uh, mapping system for the US. Each panel dives into more story maps and web apps. A story map is a type of uh, online interactive map that combines text, photos, and maps. It's very good for lay people, but it's also really good for scientists and uh, students and scholars just to simply organize their information. Uh, I'll just, why do we care about these uh, concentrated animal feeding operations? They're potential sources of multiple pollutants, pathogens, nutrients that cause hypoxia and harmful, harmful algal blooms, antibiotic resistant bacteria, animal carcasses, um, heavy metals, uh, hormones, and other, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, anyway, you can read it. Uh, so, and, and these uh, farms tend to be located in rural areas, of course, and also in uh, less uh, high, low income areas and, or, or environmental justice areas. So these are areas where people don't necessarily have the resources to investigate what's going on. So uh, sometimes the groundwater and surface water become contaminated. The, um, there's issues with uh, processing the manure that comes from these plants, uh, these uh, farms. It's often spread on agricultural fields as fertilizer, which makes sense. But if that yield is too much, then it'll run off into the water. And as it's sprayed, it can drift downwind and cause respiratory distress and uh, exacerbate asthma conditions in people that live downwind from these facilities. So we wanna know where they are. And um, because of the way uh, policy and regulations work in the US, each state handles it a little bit differently. So here you have a map of states and uh, the blank states don't have very much information on, on these farms for us. States with a lot of dots have a lot of information so this just gives you a, a, a glance at the, uh, the number of APOs out there and the colors are pink is swine, green is dairy, brown is cattle and uh, yellow is poultry. Just for fun, or this is satellite image or air photo, these circled areas are animal feeding operations. They live in barns mostly. There's uh, the, one, the circled ones in green are known facilities, the ones in red are unknown. So we are using remote sensing methods to uh, machine learning methods to go in and identify these things for us so that we can have a better idea of which watersheds need protection, which, communi which communities might be more exposed. And uh, yeah, that's that. And then finally, we build these image dashboards. Uh, in this, you have six panels each panel is a map of the same area, but showing different um, data layers. And as you pan and zoom, each of those panels updates, they're all linked to each other. So in this particular one, I'm highlighting the elevation, dark is low elevation, 
bright is high elevation. And our CAFO, our, our farm inspectors need to know if there's an accident at that site or a hurricane comes along, which happens in my state frequently, where is the manure gonna run off and will it reach waters of the US and become a health hazard ecosystem or human? And this is one way we do that. And then finally, another type of dashboard combines graphs and uh, maps. So on the right, you have a map. We have a number of points plotted. These are potential sources or known sources of PFAS chemicals in the environment. And on the left, it's showing us how many people are shown in this field of view, how many are low income, linguistically isolated, over 64 years old, et cetera. And as you pan and zoom, the graph on the left updates. So it gives our managers and um, non-GIS staff a way to do sort of screening level looks at their areas of interest to determine rapidly, okay, do we need to go in and look more in depth at a particular area. And I'll leave it at that and say thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Drew. Um, it was a great overview of uh, what you've been doing. I, there's some claps coming in the chat there. Um, I see there's one question that's come in from Brendan Conway. Um, it says, many thanks, Drew, very interesting. The AFO GIS trail in slide 26 is reminiscent of the great work that John Snow tracing the source of cholera in London. We are standing on the shoulders of, of giants, uh, says Brendan. Um, if there's people who have questions, if you want to pop them into the chat, um, I can kind of feed them to Drew. But maybe I, I would ask you uh, one question just to kick off, Drew. And that's to a little bit about this question you, you touched on quite a, a number of times. And I know from speaking to you a little bit in the, the coffee room and so on, that you have a concern with environmental justice and how the research that, that you do at the, at the EPA can kind of potentially feed into that. So I, I kind of wonder about this question of, you know, you're making all these um, collecting data and then making these um, apps available as, as kind of tools for various kind of publics. So what, I mean, what role does that play? Or let me rephrase that. Who do you think the publics are for the EPA in terms of kind of the work you're doing in relation to environmental justice? Or do you think it's kind of you're making things available and then it's up to local governments, to activist groups, to communities to kind of use those tools for their end to build cases? Or is there something here of kind of a, the EPA having a kind of um, a role of the state in kind of promoting environmental justice uh, ends? Or, so I don't know if that's a complicated question for you to answer politically, but how, how do you, what do you feel the yeah. role of the EPA's tools are? Yeah, that's a great question and it is complicated. Um, EPA's role here mostly is assembling the data and information and putting it in forms that EPA staff can use, but more importantly, public. And as much as we can, we make the information we collect publicly available. It's, it's a federal mandate in the US. So um, and environmental justice, uh, I don't have a good definition at hand, but it's, it addresses socioeconomic and demographic inequality and uh, often uh, impoverished communities or disadvantaged communities experience uh, health burdens because of uh, various environmental stressors. So we have uh, something called EJ Screen, which is EPA's mm. main environmental justice mapping tool. And what that does is creates a number of environmental indices based on census information of socioeconomic data, demographic data, like uh, education levels, income, uh, linguistic isolation, race, uh, home ownership, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it allows uh, rapid screening uh, in a geographic sense of looking for hot spots, looking for areas where with limited resources, where are we gonna focus? And the, the communities that use them, uh, it's used internally at EPA, but it's also used a lot by non-governmental organizations, NGOs, community rights organizations, individuals, researchers, uh, students, you name it. Uh, EnviroAtlas is similarly used. And I didn't mention it, but EnviroAtlas is a collection of uh, 
physical geography layers, biogeophysical variables, but also socioeconomic data and demographic information all in one place. So it makes it easier to begin to get a handle on the systems level perspective on things. Mm -hmm. Can I answer your question? Absolutely. I mean, I think the two examples that you used of a geo PFAS and AOF, AFO map were uh, kind of great tools of seeing, you know, the, the, the mapping risks and who might be exposed to those. So this question come in from, from Iris, who I think is probably sitting in the corner of the room next to you there. Um, but I will read it out because others won't hear it if, if she voices it to you there. Um, so Iris asks, you mentioned the importance of understanding the deeper levels of how the data that is then shared on these platforms is derived and the uncertainties around it. Can you share your thoughts on A, how you can convey the data to users without losing their insights while communi communicating these uncertainties? And B, any examples of what happens when this goes wrong? Um, a, how do we convey, right? Uh, well, story maps is a really good way to do that. And lots of disclaimers and lots of caveats and being very upfront with what's known what's not known, what's uncertain, what's ambiguous. And when you lay it all out, it, it can become kind of confusing to lay people uh, because it's even confusing to an expert when you lay it all out. And again, I'll say systems thinking is crucial. Um, and it's also very difficult because we, we have to think in a transdisciplinary way because in the environment, uh, and in the economy, everything is connected at some point. Well, maybe not everything, but in a sense, everything is. And um, yet our institutions, um, our academic promotion favors a siloed approach. It takes more time and energy to talk to your colleagues who are doing something completely different. It, it might give you a greater understanding, but it takes up a lot of time. You maybe don't get as much research done. So. There's a, a dynamic balance there. Anyway, how do we communicate uh, uh, the limitations of the data, I think, and the uncertainties? Uh, we have very stringent quality assurance uh, uh, policies in place in the Office of Research and Development that I work in. So before we begin research, we have to have a quality assurance project plan in place that shows what the data are we're using, what are the known uncertainties, what are the compounding effects when these layers are combined? Um, and uh, yeah, so there's that. And uh, let's see, that's part of A. Um, and then B, uh, examples of what happens when this goes wrong. I can't think of anything fast enough. Um, did, was that a helpful answer? It is. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> this is a hi hybrid, hybrid talks in the corner. So we have a talk coming in, uh, Drew, from Jenny Stevens, who is, I don't know if you've met Jenny, uh, but she's a professor of S sustainability and environmental justice in Northeastern University in, in Boston, who's also, we're glad to be hosting for this year. Uh, Jenny says, thanks, Drew. How do you anticipate the new Justice 40 initiative, the US federal legislation that mandates 40% of benefits of federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities will be implemented in the EPA and the influence, the work of you and your colleagues? So that's a great question. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, yeah, environmental justice is a top priority of the current administration and has been from the get-go. Uh, um, uh, we have our EJ screen tool. The White House has the Justice 40. The, I forget what they call their, their indices and tools, but um, EPA has a lot of people mobilized to work with uh, communities to understand what resources are available. EPA gives out a lot of grants to community organizations. So it's, so it's the best time ever for uh, community and community rights groups to access EPA resources and funding to address environmental justice issues. Uh, I hope that answers your question, but right back or jump in. Okay. So Brendan uh, Conway says, what more can teachers and governments do to enhance teaching with and about GIS in schools? 
uh, and uh, ARC GIS Online has been free for all schools in Europe for several years, but a lot more needs to be done to embed it in students' knowledge and understanding. So I, I don't know, maybe if you can also comment about how GIS is or is not um, taught in schools in the US, for instance. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Good question. And back to your uh, John Snow, absolutely. Um, that was sort of the origin of uh, epidemiological mapping and uh, the, the basis for a lot of what we do at EPA now. So I mentioned earlier, we're in the age of slippy maps, Google maps. Everyone pretty soon is going to be literate in how to pan zoom and, and toggle layers on and off. So um, at EPA, we have a lot of outreach activities where um, schools can contact us. And if there's an expert in GIS in the area, they can come out and talk to the school. The Enviro Atlas I mentioned has uh, many K through 12 lesson plans. All of them have spatial components. I don't know about uh, general um, initiatives across the nation for GIS literacy, but there are several organizations that work on just that. URISA is one that comes to mind. Um, I'm optimistic and hopeful that with time, everyone is going to have some basic GIS literacy, but that could be decades away. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure that answers your question. I'm cautiously optimistic. I was wondering, I think I was going to ask if John wanted to, but I think John has teaching. He, he appeared and then has, has disappeared again. I saw his face pop up at some point. I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit more about what it is that you are going to be doing with John and his team. I mean, I think Wahaj is here. I'm not sure if there's others of the, of the team um, that are, that are Louis. Um, so maybe you can talk to that. There's a question also from Louis coming in which I, I will read to you and, and maybe you can kind of combine those a little comment a little bit up, about what you're going to be doing in Ireland. So Louis says, thanks for this great presentation, Jew. I'm impressed by the amount and density of data used by the EPA. Do you also work in partnership with private companies, e.g., uh, for example, consultancies for data collection? Yeah, let me answer that one first. Um, yes, so EPA has 14 and a half thousand federal employees, but we have probably equal that number of contract and uh, staff that work with us closely. We also partner with universities, other uh, federal agencies in the US. Um, a little bit less, we partner with uh, international entities. Some of the main groups that come to mind for me on the uh, environmental side, ecosystem services are Nature Conservancy, um, I'm blanking. There's a few others, but Nature Conservancy is one of the big ones that help us with, uh, they have tremendous um, spatial data resources that we tap into. Um, yeah, I will say if you're not familiar with web services, that is something, a web service is simply uh, a way of making your data available to everybody on the planet. And that is how we do all of our work now. We, uh, we create data layers, put them into ArcGIS Online as a web service, and then anybody with the URL for that web service can bring that into their GIS and go running with it. Uh, and that's not, a, that's not an advertisement for Esri, but uh, the company that I mentioned, but they are at the forefront of this. and. Uh, but the web services are uh, are uh, uh, open. It's an open standard, so it's, it, there's nothing proprietary about that. Uh, anyway, that's that's the way everything's going. Is put your stuff online, even if you're just using it with your team, unless it's sensitive. Uh, it's probably a good idea to get it into some kind of online format so you can more easily share with your uh, collaborators. Uh, back to the question about what to do with John. Uh, we haven't gotten too far with that. Just been busy setting up. I'm still trying to get my accounts straightened away and find a house and stuff. But uh, John's been looking at peatlands. Uh, peatlands is a huge issue in Ireland, as some may know. 
historically, it's been a very important part of people heating and creating uh, electricity and energy in Ireland. On the other hand, uh, peatlands are tremendous carbon sequestration, carbon sinks, and tremendous biodiversity hotspots. So when we mine peatlands for fuel, we are cutting back on biodiversity and releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And the EU has something like uh, 56 peatland areas in Ireland that are supposed to be protected. So uh, one thing we can do with the uh, remote sensing technology is monitor peatlands over time to see uh, changes over time. And the synthetic aperture radar, SAR, is particularly powerful for that because it can see through clouds. I, we can say we need an image on October 1st and December 1st and February 1st, and we'll get those images. Whereas if you rely on visible light optical data, you're uh, cloud constrained. Uh, the other uh, thing that SAR is good for is looking at water content and uh, the physical roughness of a surface. So we may be able to get some information there about uh, what's going on. But if John's on, I'll ask him to comment. And otherwise, please stay tuned. Yeah, he's, 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 he's had to nip off. I noticed that Brandon uh, shares a, a map that he's uh, made with the students using the Healthy Streets data from Oliver O'Brien at, at UCL as, as, uh, for, for teaching uh, um, in schools. Um, so I know we're, we're up to time. So I do just want to say, I mean, I know Drew that you had mentioned at, at, the, at the top, it's a headline that you were kind of wanted to make yourself useful at Trinity here, but also just to kind of um, build connections and, and network um, with, with people here. So what, given that Trinity has not managed to give you an email address that I can share, what is the best way for people to, to find you? Is it the EPIE page? I mean, I don't want to share your... Uh, you, you can just find me, uh, drew.pyland at Gmail. Um, pretty soon I'll have a TCD account, maybe right after this call who goes. <laughs> and uh, I'm often in the blue room at the Fre Freeman Library here. Um, and I, I, I love talking to students and uh, staff and just I'm eager to hear what you're up to and, and how we might brainstorm together. Yeah, so we're, we're very glad to, to have you, very lucky to have you. So I, I would encourage people to, 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 to reach out and, and uh, welcome Drew here. And also, of course, there's the, the coffee mornings in, uh, in Trinity at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays for those of you who are Trinity staff and students. Uh, I think not, not everyone who's attending is. So kind of please do make a, a Drew welcome. And also, you know, he, he has offered himself as a resource. <laughs> so that, that's uh, also make, make, you, make use of him. So just to say thanks very much, to Drew, for this really nice uh, opportunity to hear about your work and, and also kind of get to know uh, you a little bit, introduce yourself to the, to the department. I hope there'll be more chances for those of us who are here. Who are here. Um, and to say that next week, I'm sorry, not next week, in two weeks time on the 20th of October, um, we have the next in the series, which is Nick uh, Scrockton from Maynooth, who is going to be talking about abrupt climate change in the Holocene and historical civilizational collapse. So uh, another physical geography uh, talk, but really leading as this did as well into the kind of social dimensions of of, uh, of understanding uh, environmental change. Um, so please join us for that. And thanks very much, Drew. Um, and, thank you all uh, very much for attending and thank you geography department for having me. I, again, I'm just thrilled to be here. Thanks a million. I'll, I'll end the recording. Uh,